Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Itamar Hartstein, I'm from Singular. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Celery. Uh, how many people here have uh, used or heard about Celery? Uh, okay, so uh, quite a good number. Um, so I'm going to talk about a bit about it and some things that we, do, we did to make it uh, uh, good for our use case. Um, I'll start a bit uh, with a short introduction about uh, Singular. Uh, so uh, basically what we do in Singular, we are an analytics uh, company. Uh, we provide analytics for uh, mobile marketers. Basically, uh, um, this is an example of the customers that we work with and typically uh, what they do, they advertise in many different uh, marketing channels, uh, especially the famous ones like uh, Facebook, AdWords, uh, and so on. And also they collect data from their uh, internal BI and uh, uh, and events that have happened between in the app. And what we try to do, we try to eventually join all that data and provide them uh, smart uh, analytics about that. Uh, uh, this is a general introduction. If you want to hear more, we, we also have our uh, booth outside, so you're welcome to join. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about Celery. Uh, I'll uh, do a short introduction for people that don't know it. And then I'm going to dive a bit into uh, the integration that we did and some challenges that we had while uh, using it. Um, so let's talk a bit about Celery. So uh, Celery is a task management system. Eventually what it allows you, it, it basically allows you to distribute uh, tasks uh, on uh, different uh, servers uh, where you can actually uh, allocate different resources to different types of tasks. Um, so it's a... Uh, it was really convenient for us. We had a pretty uh, a significant pipeline that we had to implement. Uh, and uh, if you want, uh, start, uh, actually, uh, in order to start use Celery, basically, this is all the boilerplate that you need. So I'll walk off a bit about uh, what we have here. Uh, so basically, all you need to get started with Celery is a simple tasks file, uh, which contains mostly three things. First is an app, uh, you define a sort of a global app. And the main thing there is something called the broker, uh, which is basically uh, just a means to uh, transfer messages between different components of the system. And specifically, it contains queues that you can add tasks to. Uh, and the task definition is very straightforward. Basically, it's just Python functions that you add a special uh, decorator to. Um, and then you can just uh, run workers that uh, connect to this broker. Um, specific, specifically, they connect to it because I told it to use the tasks model that I defined here. Um, uh, if we dive in a bit more detail about the architecture of Celery, so eventually you have tasks, so you can define uh, different uh, types of tasks. So in this example, we have four tasks that are divided to uh, two categories. So we have uh, two arithmetic tasks and two monitoring tasks, so we allocated different queues to them. And then we can use that to uh, allocate uh, different uh, workers that can consume from one or more queues. Uh, and uh, each one has their own uh, concurrency, concurrency setting, so it can run potentially more or less tasks. Um, and the tasks can also optionally uh, have results, and these results can be saved uh, to a result backend. And one of the nice things about Celery, and one of the main reasons that we liked it and wanted it in uh, Singular, uh, is that you can actually customize the technology that you use both in the broker end and in the backend end. Uh, so specifically, we used Redis for the broker because we really love Redis and we used it uh, in many uh, systems uh, in Singular. Uh, and the result backend can basically be any type of uh, database that uh, Django or, or SQL Alchemy support, and also uh, Redis or uh, MemcacheD or uh, Elasticsearch or many other uh, uh, types uh, of uh, systems. It's really easy to extend, so there are a lot of uh, open source implementations for that as well. Um, and another cool thing about Celery um, is the ability to define interesting workflows. This is something that also greatly appealed to us, uh, specifically the ability to define all sorts of uh, dependencies between tasks. So for example, you can define that certain tasks run uh, sequentially and depend on the result of the previous tasks. So this is done with chains in Celery. So uh, what you can see here, you have uh, three uh, sum tasks. You can actually see that the uh, last two only receive one parameter because the, the previous parameter is the result uh, of the last task. And uh, you have uh, very little requirements here. The tasks can run on completely different servers, different environments, and all you have to do is to make sure that they are connected to the same broker. Uh, in a similar way, you can also define the tasks run in parallel. 
this is done with something called groups. Uh, and uh, eventually the, the cool thing here is the ability to combine them both. So you can define something that's called a chord, which basically means that you have a group of tasks and you run a callback after all of them finish. Uh, and Celery supports synchronizing that uh, in a pretty cool way. Um, so that's a, that's a short introduction about Celery. Um, if we dive a bit into our integration, then uh, I discussed before uh, how that we eventually connect with many different uh, partners. So uh, the way we do that is basically we had to implement an API or, s or some kind of way to pull data from many different data sources. So we actually have an integration for each one, like a Python file that we implement. Uh, so we have one for Facebook, Google, and so on. And we actually have also one for ourselves for uh, data that we collect from uh, mobile apps that install our SDK. Um, so we have a tasks for each one of them. And then afterwards, we have a lot of processing tasks that depend on the result of the previous task. And eventually, we have a step called combining, which actually means that we need to join data from many different data sets that actually re refers to the same things. So um, uh, yeah, eventually, after we do that, then we uh, uh, integrate everything to a database called Druid, and that powers both our uh, reporting UI and, uh, and API. Uh, the main thing that I wanted to note here is that there are a lot of uh, squares of different tasks that we have here, and they have a lot of dependencies between each other. Uh, so we wanted to be able to do that uh, uh, in a high scale. Um, some numbers, so uh, and the number of tasks that we run per day is not huge, but it's significant, so it's around uh, 1 million tasks per day. Uh, we have uh, uh, about 100 uh, task types, uh, 44 queues, uh, around 130 workers. Uh, and maybe one of the more interesting things is that uh, tasks are rather unpredictable. So uh, they can take uh, uh, less than a second and they can take uh, 20 hours, uh, especially because we depend on third parties that can sometimes be slow to pull data from. Uh, the same goes with memory. So uh, if you pull data, uh, granular data from Facebook or AdWords, then it can contain a lot more data than uh, uh, a relatively small integration. And uh, so that's something we have to account for as well. And of course, different customers have different requirements. Uh, if I dive a bit more into our use case, so I think our use case is a bit different, which might explain why we also did some things differently, like we'll discuss in a bit. Uh, so let's talk a bit about the common use case. And again, this is the common use case as, as we picture it. Of course, there are many different use cases, and Celery applies uh, to many use cases. But I think in Celery was primarily designed to handle a very large amount of relatively small tasks. Um, so common examples are things like event processing or offloading tasks from uh, uh, web servers. Uh, in these scenarios, I think it's pretty common to say that we'll uh, stop the stream of events with them when we deploy, and then uh, we'll restart workers, and then we'll be able to, up, to update code in this way. Um, uh, workflows are, uh, while Celery supports quite complicated workflows, I think that most of the scenarios that I usually heard about from friends is uh, uh, where tasks typically don't have a lot of dependencies between each other. Uh, but again, that can be, uh, uh, that can change, of course, between implementations. Uh, if we dive a bit uh, into our use case, so there's a lot of variation in duration because uh, integration with third parties can be different. Uh, so uh, tasks can take up hours, uh, which makes restarting workers on every deploy problematic. Uh, we have continuous deployment. We, de we do uh, dozens of deployments per day. So uh, we definitely don't want to restart workers every time. Uh, another thing is unpredictability. So uh, tasks can fail, can hang, again, because we depend on third parties. And there's a lot of dependencies, mostly due to the pipeline that I showed before. Um, so uh, that brings me to five challenges that I want to dive a bit into. Uh, the first one, which I think is the, is the most interesting one is probably, uh, or maybe the most common one at least, is the, is the one of updating code and what we did to support that. Uh, we'll talk a bit about customizations that we did. Celery is very, very easy to extend, so, uh, uh, so I'll show some examples of that. Uh, I'll talk a bit about shorts. Uh, it's one of the workflows that we showed earlier and some experience that we had with it. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about two problems, specifically uh, killed workers and, and the prefetching behavior, which I'll touch a bit later. Uh, so updating code. So uh, 
Uh, that, in order to understand the problem of updating code, we need to understand a bit uh, how workers uh, operate. So uh, the idea is pretty simple. In, a, in the default uh, setting, uh, what happens in Celery is that you have a main process, uh, and then you have uh, uh, sub-processes that are spawned from it. Basically, they're forked from the main process. Uh, it's kind of a library that wraps uh, multiprocessing. Uh, and uh, when you realize that, that one of the most interesting thing is where is your code uh, actually imported? Uh, so uh, uh, obviously, if something is imported in the main process, uh, that then it's going to be in each forked process uh, until the worker is restarted. And so we wanted to understand exactly what needs to be imported in the main process, and we quite quickly understood that our tasks definitions are important in the main model, uh, the configuration as well if we use it, and uh, also uh, if you do use a Django backend, then Django itself is going to be imported and all the models code. Uh, so uh, specifically, we wanted to avoid, uh, we wanted to be able to update task code uh, rather quickly, and we also wanted to update models quickly uh, due to the nature of what we do. Um, so we ended up doing three things. Uh, first, it's kind of a simple trick, but it's rather effective, so I can recommend it to you if you have a similar problem. And the idea was basically to just uh, move all the code that actually matters to a separate module. Uh, so we have tasks py, which is loaded in the master process, but it doesn't contain any logic. Basically, all it does is import an uh, inner module and then call the relevant implementation. Um, you can see that in the, the, the the file tasks inner is actually a file that is only imported when the task actually runs. Um, so, uh, and it contains both the imports that we use and the actual task implementation. So we can actually update the uh, task code uh, pretty much immediately after deploys without restarting the workers. Uh, the only problem is that if you actually want to add new tasks, then you still have to restart, but that happens less often. Uh, in order for that to actually work, we also had to define that uh, uh, each new task will actually be executed in a new process. This is not ideal for all use cases. If you have a lot of tasks, then uh, uh, maybe it's not ideal. But in our case, we had a, a, a number of tasks that is not necessarily large, but, uh, but the tasks themselves, themselves can take a long time. So we definitely prefer to work this way. Uh, and finally, we also wanted to be able to update uh, Django models, so we actually decided to stop using a Django backend entirely. And uh, we'll, we'll say in a bit what we did instead. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And from that moment on, updating code wasn't really a concern. Uh, we added some safeties to make sure that uh, we don't import more than we intend to in the master process. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a bit about customizations that we needed to do. Uh, so. Uh, we, uh, so Seri, as I said, is very extendable. And one of the first areas that we noticed that is with serialization. Uh, so because it's a distributed system, then uh, obviously you need to serialize and serialize quite a lot. Specifically, uh, you need to serialize arguments uh, when you call a task, and you need to serialize results when they finish. Uh, and in order to do that, then Celery supports multiple serialization methods. Uh, it used to be uh, Pickle by default. They changed it to JSON. You can also use uh, Message Pack and YAML and maybe some other things. Uh, pickle is the most flexible. You can pickle almost everything, but it's also insecure. You can easily run uh, arbitrary code when you load Pickle. Um, so we did want to use JSON, but we wanted a bit more flexibility than what JSON can provide. Uh, so uh, the solution was pretty simple. We just did a JSON with the custom encoder and decoder. There are many examples online of how to do that. And in order to actually uh, uh, register, uh, register it, then this is pretty much all the code you need. You just define, uh, you need to define it in uh, multiple configurations, and then you just register a new serialization method. Um, we called it almighty JSON because it supports more stuff. Um, and uh, and with time, we added more stuff here, but basically it allows us to uh, serialize anything we want. Uh, the next thing uh, that we wanted to customize is the result backend. So the result backend is actually quite useful because it contains information about every task that ever uh, runs in your system. Uh, so uh, we ended up using it a lot to monitor what actually happens. Did tasks actually run? Uh, did they fail or succeed and so on? Uh, but we, could, we quickly found out that there's a lot, not a lot of uh, information in there. 
specifically, uh, you can't find the task name there, you can't find the arguments there, and you definitely can't find custom information that is relevant to you, like, for example, we wanted to know the customer name and maybe pivot tasks by it. Uh, we wanted to have uh, an ad network. This is, some, uh, this is an example that is specific to Singular. We wanted to be able to divide tasks by integration. Uh, we'll, we have a notion of uh, scrape IDs and so on. That doesn't really matter. Uh, eventually, we understood that we wanted our own custom table. Uh, so we did just that. We created a custom database table. Uh, and we added to it all the default fields in Celery plus a few additional fields. Uh, in order to do that, uh, this is not supported by default in Celery, so what we did is to implement a backend. Uh, this is also pretty simple in Celery. Basically, you have a, a base a class called base backend. You need to implement a few functions. The main ones are just how to store a result and how to get a result. Um, once you do that, you just need to configure it, and then you can use your own backend. So uh, this is what we ended up doing, and uh, here in the implementation, we actually defined that we'll uh, write and uh, read from our own custom table. Uh, we did it uh, with uh, raw, uh, raw SQL instead of Django, because this is uh, imported in the master process. Um, and uh, that was really useful to us. Um, and finally, we also uh, made sure, this is pretty standard in Celery, but uh, uh, good to know. Um, we, def we made sure we have a lot of tasks, but we wanted some custom logic, uh, common logic to be in all of them. Uh, so we defined it the base uh, singular task, and we defined the, uh, we used it mostly to define uh, monitoring and logging uh, capabilities. So uh, for example, we wanted to make sure that time and memory performance is recorded for each task in the system, uh, or uh, re report uh, exceptions to salary, or add more parameters to Kibana. Uh, so this was really easy to do with uh, base task. Um, and that, that pretty much covers the cons customization parts. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit something that's a bit more internal, but I think it's interesting. Uh, so uh, if you remember, I talked about workflows a bit earlier. So uh, uh, specifically, I talked about chords. Chords is the ability to run several tasks in parallel and then define a callback that is uh, a run after all of them finish. And we really liked that. It was really useful for us. Uh, we had a lot of dependencies that look like that. But unfortunately, it turned out pretty quickly to be inefficient when you use it a lot. Uh, actually, the, the salary documentation recommends you not to overuse it, but we did want to use it a bit more than the average. Uh, uh, but we noticed that really, uh, one of the things that surprised us is that we had a worker initially that runs with 20 processes, and we saw that only 10 or 12 run in parallel. So what happened exactly? Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, there's a nice UI that is usually accompanied uh, with Celery. It's called uh, uh, Flower. So uh, you can use it to monitor in real time what happens with your tasks. Um, and what we noticed pretty quickly is that there's a task that we never defined. Okay. Um, there's a task that we never defined called Chord Unlock. And uh, pretty much what it does is to... Um, um, so we didn't know what it means, and eventually we understood that what it does is to actually uh, poll the tasks until they're finished. That's how chores are, are implemented in Celery. And the polling is done every second. Now, it's done in, in a way that's, uh, uh, that's rather smart. It doesn't actually busy wait on the tasks, but it uh, just, if the dependencies are not ready, then it just queues itself for a second later. But still, when you have tasks that take hours, uh, then uh, it can be a bit problematic. Uh, so uh, we wanted something different, and, and it turns out that in some backend implementations, there is a different uh, option. Specifically, when you use a Redis backend, then they simply do a counter. So the idea is pretty straightforward. Every, new ta every task that finishes increments a counter in Redis, and when the final task finishes, then it calls the callback. So uh, no, uh, uh, no, uh, no uh, additional uh, tasks are needed to do that. Uh, there were some other issues that we solved while using this. I can explain later if someone is interested. Uh, but uh, this was really great to us, and we added this to our own custom backend, and it did what we needed. And finally, I'm going to talk about two short uh, uh, issues. Um, workers can be killed brutally, specifically if they take an unknown amount of memory. Uh, uh, and more specifically, if you use a, a Linux environment, that they can be killed by the out-of-memory killer. Um, and that's something that we wanted to at least be able to handle if we can't avoid it completely. And uh, so it turns out that when a child process, the process that actually runs the task dies, then uh, the master process is just notified and marks the failure. 
but uh, it's more problematic when a main process dies. And actually, uh, the out of memory killer is called when all hope is lost. So it kind of uh, it has some kind of logic to decide which process will die, and it's not necessarily the one with the highest amount of memory. Uh, so in order to avoid that, there's something called early OOM, which basically, uh, instead of waiting to the last minute, it can say that whenever the memory is uh, less than 10% or something, then uh, the larger process will die. And you can also optimize that by actually defining a larger score for killing them to the child process and then the main processes. So that was useful to us. I'm going to talk just a bit about the uh, last uh, slide that I have here. Uh, so uh, another th the final thing that we wanted to optimize in our use case uh, is the logic of prefetching. So it turns out that Celery, by default, tries to send as many tasks as possible to different uh, child processes to run. Uh, when you have a lot of tasks, it makes sense. It doesn't, uh, there's no overhead of uh, uh, spreading tasks for each individual one. Uh, but it's a problem when you have uh, long and inconsistent tasks. So you don't want to have five queued tasks that take uh, five hours on one worker and have uh, 19 idle workers. Uh, so you can actually disable that logic if you want. Uh, there are two uh, parameters that help you to do that. Uh, one is called OFAIR, which, which basically means that master processes will not uh, send tasks to child processes unless they are available to run them. And the second tells that uh, the parent process itself will not take from the queues uh, more tasks than it needs to, which is one per, uh, per uh, child. Uh, so if you have a similar use case, then you can use that as well. So uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, do we have some time for questions? Okay. The question was uh, um, uh, how does the OM killer uh, operate, and specifically if we can easily recover from it. Uh, that, that actually depends uh, on whether uh, your child process dies or your master process dies. If the child process dies, then Celery knows how to recover from that automatically. It just notices that the child died, then it, it creates a new one and also marks a failure. If a parent process dies, then, then you don't have a lot to do. I mean, if you use something like supervisor, you can restart your workers, but you want to avoid that if you can. Um, Okay, so uh, the question was that uh, do we have, uh, uh, when we have failures, do we have some measure to make sure that uh, a task is not, not half done? And um, so uh, eventually what is interesting to us, uh, the main metric for us is to measure data delays. So uh, we have like kind of a business logic that says, was data updated for a particular source for a particular customer? And then we have logics to, uh, uh, to, to see what is the current status for, for it and then decide to re-update the data. So that's how we chose to uh, solve it. Uh, not by monitoring specific tasks. Um, so I'm not sure if perfectly, I think you said that if we use a fixed number of workers or use auto-scaling. Uh, so we actually started to use auto-scaling at some point and had a lot of difficulties with it. So we, we decided eventually to use a fixed number. Uh, maybe it's something that was fixed in later versions, I'm not sure. Uh, so in, in our use case, at least, we use uh, fixed numbers, a fixed number of workers. Uh, uh, we definitely have a memory problem with certain tasks. So for example, for the large integrations that we have with Facebook and AdWords, we have dedicated workers that do just that, uh, even dedicated servers. Um, yeah, we, we definitely see problems in some of these cases. Okay, uh, thank you very much.